Hi guys, welcome to Unit 2, Chapter 1, where we're going to learn about cell organelles. As always, if you click on this book, you can get the guided notes. Today we're going to discuss microscopes, how different microscopes are used, how they were invented. We're going to talk about the cell theory. We're going to explore different types of cells and how their structure relates to their function. We're going to list all the major parts of a generalized cell and compare and contrast that with plants versus animals. Then we're going to talk about prokaryotic versus eukaryotic and talk about the endosymbiotic theory. So let's go ahead and get started. The fundamental units of life is the cell. They are the building blocks of all living organisms, but it's only visible because of the invention of a microscope. So if you want to, you can click right here and we can visit this site where we're going to talk about how small or see how small a cell is. So we can just zoom in as much as we want to. Comparing this to a coffee bean or a grain of rice, the largest single celled organism is an amoeba and it's much, much smaller than a grain of rice, but that's still not as small as a human skin cell. You can see the human skin cell right here with the nucleus. The nucleus is pretty large. It's about the same size as a red blood cell. Red blood cells actually don't have a nuclei. And then even smaller than that, here we see a chromosome. This is the genetic material. Humans have 46 of these. Um, and then here is a bacterium. About the same size as the bacterium is a mitochondrion, okay? This is the uh, energy source of all cells, and it's about the same size as a bacteria. Even smaller than that are viruses, but the smallest organelle here is a ribosome. And we'll talk about ribosomes today as well, but it's just a group of um, um, RNA and some protein that makes up this ribosomal complex. Here you can see proteins uh, like hemoglobin and how small they are. And then a phospholipid. Remember from last week, we went over what a phospholipid is. That's what it looks like by itself, one single phospholipid. But a whole bunch of phospholipids will make up the cell membrane that goes all the way around every single organelle and every single cell. Switching back, um, the invention of the microscope was kind of um, a community effort over hundreds of years. Um, it started out as kind of a parlor trick. So Zacharias Jensen was a Dutch glass maker or a speculator maker, and he was the first one that decided that he was going to put two convex lenses together in a tube and create the very first prototype of a microscope. So he is credited with that in 1585. Um, but he kind of made this uh, microscope and it became sort of a parlor trick. Everybody around town who could afford it would have these and they would use it to look at different items. Well, it wasn't the best microscope. It only had two lenses where the ones that we use in lab have many more than that. Um, but then about a hundred years later, Anton von Leeuwenhoek decided to look at his soup. So there wasn't refrigeration back then. He ate his soup. He was looking at it at night and there wasn't really much going on. He put a cloth over it and he came back to it in the morning and started looking at it again. And he saw something he called wee beasties, tiny little microorganisms. So he was the first one to observe microorganisms under the microscope. He announced his finding, but everybody thought he was crazy. Um, until many years later when Robert Hooke uh, repeated his experiment and published his findings and then everybody believed him. So it was a joint effort. Another thing that helped the microscope was um, when Robert Hooke invented the microscope um, lamp where it was a very bright lamp and the water helped uh, this flask of water helped to focus the light onto the specimen which allowed you to see the specimen even brighter. So group effort um, between Zacharias Jensen, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, and Robert Hooke, uh, about 100 years apart. So great effort on these guys to be able to get 
uh, to the result that we have today, which is called a compound light microscope. And we have these several different lenses that help us to view items. Each one of these little compound lenses, these tubes have multiple um, lenses inside of it to help magnify that uh, specimen. So these light microscopes use several different things to increase the visibility of a specimen. Obviously magnification, just making it appear larger. But as you know, if you take a picture and then expand it, it just looks pixelated. It doesn't really look any clearer. Well, these microscopes also have resolution. So we have to find ways to increase the resolution, not just the magnification. Resolution is to be able to differentiate between two adjacent structures. Then we also need contrast, the brightness of the specimen compared to the background. So that's why your microscopes today have a backlight underneath the specimen. And you can change the brightness of that backlight to increase or decrease the contrast. Further, we get into um, different types of microscopes. Different types of microscopes do different jobs. We have a limit to how much we can see with a compound light microscope because mm, the magnification after a while starts to lose resolution because light doesn't just bend that way. Um, so we have uh, other things like an electron microscope. An electron microscope is going to bombard the specimen with electrons and then a computer is going to create an image, a computerized image based on the electrons that bounce back. You have two major types of electron microscopes. You have an SEM or a scanning electron microscope which can see the surface of items and then you have a transmission electron microscope, a TEM, that can slice right through it and see inside of a specimen, kind of like a slice of bread. Now, these are not colorized. There are electron microscopes that use a computer program to colorize it artificially. But once you get to that small of a specimen, these specimens are not investing energy into creating pigments. So usually they are very clear or hard to see. So when we're using a compound microscope, a lot of times we will use dyes to help uh, make the specimen become more visible. The cell theory states that all organisms are composed of one or more cell. Okay, an amoeba is a single celled organism, but it's still a cell. And all living cells today have to come from other cells. So I cannot take the ingredients of a cell. I can't take a handful of phospholipids, a handful of proteins, some DNA, and mix it up in a bowl and hope that a living cell comes out. It's not gonna work. All cells that we know of today have to have arisen from another pre-existing parent cell. Um, and that is the second part of the cell theory. And then cells, often have a structure related to their function. So the cell's structure is going to be related to its function. For instance, a muscle cell is gonna have lots of contract contractile filaments to help it contract. And cells usually follow this pattern of cell is the smallest unit of life. Several cells together that do the same job is called a tissue. Several tissues together that do a similar job that work together to do a job is an organ. And then several organs that work together is an organ system. Then when you have several organ systems, you have an organism. Now all cells have these four things in common. They always, always have a plasma membrane. No matter what type of cell we're talking about, it's going to have a phospholipid bilayer. Two, it's going to have cytosol, okay, which is a jelly-like substance. And we say cytoplasm, which includes everything inside of the cytosol. Three, we're going to have some sort of genetic material, either DNA or RNA, but it's going to be made of uh, nucleic acids, the genetic material. And last, we have to have ribosomes. And ribosomes, which we showed you in the magnification exercise, are very small, but they help to create all proteins in your body. Um, when we're talking about a cell, Cells are composed of mostly water, about 60% water, very fluid filled. When I'm referring to the fluid inside the cell, I will say intracellular fluid or ICF. Sometimes we use cytoplasm interchangeably with that. If I'm referring to the fluid outside the cell, I'm going to say extracellular fluid or ECF. 
intracellular is inside, extracellular is outside. Now, if I'm talking about a tissue, for instance, a cell inside my body, not a cell just floating out in a puddle of water, I might say interstitial fluid or ISF. Inter meaning in between and stitial meaning tissues. Interstitial fluid is fluid in between the tissues. So here I have a cell and here I have a cell. They both have cytoplasm or intracellular fluid inside the cell, but surrounding it is interstitial fluid because it's in between the cells. And cells range in size and shape, which often determines its function. And they can dramatic widely in their functions. For instance, here we have a red blood cell. A red blood cell does not even have a nucleus because its function does not need a nucleus. Here we have an adipose cell, which is a cell that has all the normal cell parts, but it will have this large uh, fat storage right here, oil storage right here. Um, a neuron is a great example. Its uh, shape is related to its function because it has to send the signal down this axon. We already mentioned muscles and how contractile they are. And you can even click on this cell diversity up here and look at an exercise. We're not gonna go through it, but you are welcome to click on it and work through this exercise where you view different cells and what they do. So here we have the neuron and you can watch the animation and see that how the structure is related to the neurons function of sending a signal, okay? Let's talk about the general shape of a cell. The general shell, cell shape that we're gonna go over looks kind of like this. We have all the parts here, but some cells may have more of one part or more of another part. For instance, muscles are going to have a lot of mitochondria and they're gonna have these contractile filaments. They're gonna be shaped very differently than that, but they're still gonna have all of this stuff, maybe not a flagella. But there are three main regions to most cells. It is going to be the plasma membrane, the nucleus, and the cytoplasm. Those are the three things we're gonna go over today. First, the plasma membrane is going to be made up of phospholipids, a phospholipid bilayer. We learned about phospholipids last week, how they have a hydrophilic head and then hydrophobic tails that point inward. And it automatically orients in this beautiful a bilayer pattern. There are also other things inside of the phospholipid bilayer like steroids and proteins, but the plasma membrane is not the only membrane or the cellular membrane is not the only plasma membrane. We also have intermembranes surrounding the organelles inside the cell. So in this last image, we saw these. These are also phospholipid bilayers. All of these membranes are also phospholipid bilayers. Um, cholesterol in the membrane helps to maintain flexibility. If you remember from last week, it's a heat protectant. And proteins in the membrane have a wide variety of fo functions. We are going to learn about the proteins within this membrane next week. So we'll talk a lot more about the proteins that are inside the membrane next week. Um, and there's also glycoproteins. So we'll talk about the glycoproteins and the proteins a lot more next week. This week, all we need to know about the plasma membrane is that it is a phospholipid bilayer. It has cholesterol to maintain uh, flexibility and the phospholipids have a hydrophobic portion and a hydrophilic po portion. Um, when I'm talking about the nucleus, there's usually only one nucleus per cell. That depends on what cell we're talking about. Muscle cells will have many nuclei. There's a reason for that. We'll learn about muscle cells in biology too, so we can put a pin in that. Cardiac muscle also usually has two or sometimes three nuclei, okay? Everything else pretty much just has one nuclei per cell. Nuclei are the largest organelle in the cell, usually uh, taking up like half the cell. It's pretty large and it is going to be bigger itself than most bacterium. So most bacterium are gonna be much smaller than the nucleus. The point of the nucleus is to house DNA and the nuclear envelope is going to separate that DNA from the rest of the cell. It is a double membrane, meaning it has two phospholipid bilayers. It is really protecting that DNA. 
Um, it is uh, studded with these nuclear pores and the nuclear pores will allow messenger RNA out, but will not let DNA out. Okay, the nuclear pores are going to uh, control the things that are able to enter the nucleus or leave the nucleus. Um, the nucleolus is the small darker center of the nucleus and its job is mainly to make uh, nucleic acids. So all uh, nucleic acids are going to come from the nucleolus, particularly ribosomes, which are entirely made out of RNA. So that is the point of the nucleolus here. But then all this jumbly stuff, all this jumbly up stuff out here, it's called chromatin, but it's the same as DNA. It's just DNA that hasn't been organized. And most of the cell's life, the DNA will be in the form of chromatin, just kind of hanging out in the nucleus. Now, the last thing we need to talk about is cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the material that is not in the nucleus and it's not in the membrane, okay? Anything between the nucleus and the membrane we call cytoplasm. We think of it as the jelly stuff in a cell, but it also means the organelles inside that jelly stuff. So the jelly stuff is actually called cytosol, okay, cytosol. And it's mostly made out of the water. But if I removed all the cytosol, uh, cytosol from a bunch of cells and had it in a little dish, it would look kind of like the consistency of jelly because it has so many proteins and carbohydrates dissolved in it um, in order to function that it creates like a jelly-like substance. We also have the cytoskeleton inside of the cytoplasm, and the cytoskeleton is important for maintaining the support and structure of the cell. It also aids in cell division. But the most important part of the cytoplasm is going to be the organelles. And the organelles are specialized cell parts that perform different roles and maintenance within the cell's life cycle. Here is an image representing the cytoskeleton. There are different parts of the cytoskeleton that do different jobs, but they all help to maintain the shape and function of the cell. So for instance, we have intermediate filaments. Intermediate filaments are going to help desmosomes, and uh, we'll talk about what desmosomes are later, but their main job, the intermediate filaments, are going to be resisting stretching and pulling forces. So if this cell was to be manipulated out of shape, the intermediate filaments would help to return it to its normal shape. These are the intermediate filaments that are going to stretch in a lattice all the way through the cell. We also have microfilaments. Microfilaments are going to be involved in cell motility. So if you see a flagella or a cilia, it's gonna be made up of microfilaments. Also actin, which is involved in muscle contraction. Actin is also a type of microfilament. Last, we have microtubules. Microtubules are going to be super involved in cell division. So they are uh, going to work with cell division. So here we can see cell division happening. We have this organelle in animal cells called a centriole, and it looks like this collection of tubes, but they're actually telescoping microtubules. And during cell division, they will span out creating this spider web shape of microtubules, which will actually literally control where the chromosomes go during cell division. These microtubules will also help to stretch and pinch the cell during um, cytokinesis so that the cell can separate into two daughter cells, okay? This is only found in animal cells. Plant cells have a little bit of a different method for cell division, and we'll learn about that in a few weeks when we talk about mitosis. But here we can see a good picture of the intermediate filaments, see how they're stretched out throughout the whole cell, um, and they're going to resist tearing and stretching. Then the microfilaments, they're mainly around the outside edge, but they're also involved in cell motility. Um, in my normal class, I would ask you the cytoplasm, which is made of mostly water, and the cytoskeleton, which is mostly protein, are passive. Is this true or false? And it is false because they play very, very active roles in the cell's life cycle. So they're going to be very important, especially during cell division and sometimes mobility. Next, let's talk about the organelles within the cytoplasm. So the organelles within the cytoplasm, we're going to start with the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is continuous with the nuclear envelope, so they're actually touching. 
the uh, membrane of the nuclear envelope can actually turn into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So all of these folds and tunnels here, we refer to as uh, the cistern, okay, the tunnels, and then the outside membrane is the lumen. You also notice that it's studded with all these red dots. Those represent ribosomes. The rough ER is studded with ribosomes, which are um, used in protein synthesis. So the DNA from the nucleus will enter in, or the messenger RNA will enter into the endoplasmic reticulum and be read by the ribosome, ribosomes, which will create the protein. So very important. Now, not all ribosomes are found in the endoplasmic reticulum, but most of them are found in the endoplasmic reticulum. So we call it rough ER because it is studied with these ribosomes and it is involved in protein synthesis. Um, we also have smooth ER. You can see the smooth ER back here. It's a little bit of a different shape, more tunneling, less uh, caverny. Um, and the smooth ER is also involved in synthesis, but it usually makes fats. So if uh, a steroid hormone may be produced here because it's made of fat, Phospholipids are made inside of the smooth ER, which is very important because we are constantly pinching off pieces of the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum and we're constantly needing new phospholipids to replace that. So we need lots and lots of phospholipids. Ribosomes are made up of RNA and it's made from a large complex and a small complex, okay? No hidden names there, it's just what it's called, a large and small complex, and they are what is going to create the proteins right here in this amino acid chain. Now, we're gonna go deeper into talking about ribosomes when we talk about protein synthesis, but this is kind of your introduction to ribosomes and how ribosomes are important. Most ribosomes are found inside of the endoplasmic reticulum, but some of them are found in other places like the mitochondria or the cytoplasm. The smooth ER can be highly specialized. For instance, in the testes or the ovaries, it specializes in making hormone testosterone or estrogen, um, which are cholesterol fat-based hormones. But it can be even further specialized. For instance, in muscle cells, this represents a muscle cell. It's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it has been modified to store calcium for muscle contraction. So it has a slightly different job. Um, but it's still from the same sort of uh, organelle, the endoplasmic reticulum. Next, we're going to go over the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus. It looks very similar to the endoplasmic reticulum, but it is not attached to the nucleus. It is kind of free and on its own. The Golgi is comprised of a stack of flattened membrane. Remember, those membranes are made of phospholipids. And its job is to package and modify proteins. So proteins that are produced in the endoplasmic reticulum will be sent here through a transport vesicle. When the transport vesicle bumps into the Golgi apparatus, it kind of blends in. Those phospholipids just join right here. And then the protein can kind of travel through these different layers. And the different layers will add different functional groups or different folding. Uh, to modify this protein to be its most functional state. Um, it is going to do this through a secretary, or it's going to package the finished deal into a vesicle, a secretory vesicle, which will secrete or be sent out of the cell. Um, they also make something called a lysosome. A lysosome, well, a lysosome is going to be a special type of secretory vesicle, but the vesicle holds lysozymes, which is an enzyme that helps to break things down. So in something like autophagy, where maybe we have an organelle that's not functioning anymore, it might join the vesicle surrounding that dysfunctional organelle, break it down to its amino acids and its phospholipids, and then recycle that item. Same thing with phagocytosis. When the cell brings in a food particle, the lysosome will join that food particle and digest it, break it down into glucose. Uh, so lysosomes are uh, membrane-bound sacs containing digestive enzymes. They function as the demolition or recycling centers, but they are only found in animal cells, only found in animal cells, not plant cells. 
plants and animals have something called a peroxisome. They function similarly, but a little bit different than the lysosomes. The peroxisomes also contain enzymes, but the enzymes are there to neutralize harmful substances in the cell. Um, they are abundant in liver cells because your liver is doing a job or a function that needs to have a lot of peroxisomes, okay? Um, let's go back and look at this image. This is just a better image of the Golgi apparatus. You can see the transport vesicle filled with proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum will come here, join the membrane, and then that protein will travel through these layers, eventually being secreted as a transport vesicle or secretory vesicle filled with that protein. If the enzyme is lysosome, then it's a lysosome, okay? Proteins that are produced by ribosomes in the endoplasmic reticulum are always packaged in vesicles and sent straight to the cell membrane. Is that true or is it false? In this case, it's false because of the word always. The endoplasmic reticulum will pinch off a piece of its lumen holding the uh, finished protein here. Sometimes that protein will go straight to the membrane, but most of the time it's going to bump into the Golgi apparatus and that lumen or that phospholipid bilayer will join the layers of the Golgi apparatus until it, the protein has been completely modified. Once it's been modified, it will been, then be put into a secretory transport vesicle to be sent to the plasma membrane. All right, plants don't have lysosomes. They do have peroxisomes, but they have something that we don't. Um, they have something called a central vacuole. It's a very large uh, vacuole housing water, and it's very important for the structure of the plant. Remember, plants have a cell wall made of cellulose, but the cellulose by itself is not strong enough to make the plant stand up it needs to be inflated with this water vacuole. So this plant would be turgid, meaning it's standing straight up. If the plant is dehydrated, it may become flaccid and wilt. That's because it doesn't have enough water. Um, if it becomes plasmalized, that means that it doesn't have nearly enough water and the vacuole has shrunken so much that the cell membrane has separated from the cell wall and this plant will likely die. Switching gears a little bit, let's talk about mitochondria. Mitochondria are double layered organelles. So some organelles are membrane bound organelles and the mitochondria actually has two membranes, two different phospholipid bilayers. And the inner membrane is actually a lot larger than the outer membrane. The inner membrane has these folds or cristae to help increase the surface area. Now, the energy that mitochondria create is in the form of ATP energy. The matrix or the jelly-like substance inside the inner membrane, known as the matrix, will break pyruvate down to create ATP. But the real money, most of the ATP, is made along the membrane. That's why the cristae is so important to increasing that surface area, because we want this membrane to be as big as possible because the electron transport chain happens along this membrane. And that's where most of the ATP is made. Plants and animals have mitochondria. Plants also have to have mitochondria. So both plants and animals will have this. But plants will also have their own um, organelle called a chloroplast. It's called a chloroplast because it has a green pigment called chlorophyll. And that green pigment gets excited when it hits uh, sunlight or when sunlight hits it. It gets excited and starts releasing electrons, which causes a chain reaction, which allows this organelle to capture carbon from the atmosphere and turn it into sugar. Super cool process. We're gonna learn a lot more about it when we go over cellular respiration in a few weeks. Um, this is also a double membrane uh, organelle. It has two membranes. It also has these stacks of things called thylakoids. The stack of thylakoid called a granum is going to be where that photosynthesis reaction takes place. It also has this layer where it has something similar to the electron transport chain, but it works a little bit differently. Um, it has a stroma, whereas the mitochondria had a matrix. 
the chloroplast has stroma, it's the fluid filled area. And the interesting thing about mitochondria and chloroplast is that it has its own set of DNA. It has different DNA than your nucleus. So your nucleus has DNA, but then the chloroplast and the mitochondria has its own DNA. Um, here it says most of the ATP energy in plants is produced in mitochondria, true or false? And that is true. Mitochondria create ATP. Chloroplasts create sugars. Okay, so chloroplast is for storing energy, whereas AT or the mitochondria creates ATP, releases the energy from that sugar and turns it into ATP. And I like these diagrams because here in the transmission electron microscope, you can see the different cristae. And here in this diagram, you can see the mitochondrial DNA. It's in these little ring shapes. All right, cell mobility. Um, cells have two main ways that they can travel. One is with the cilia, which is these little finger-like projections. Do not confuse this with microvilli. Microvilli are also little projections, but their intention is to absorb nutrients, where this is uh, much smaller than a microvilli, and it just kind of flicks back and forth or strokes back and forth and helps the uh, organism move. This is mostly found in bacterium, and they're usually covering the whole thing, and it just kind of flickers back and forth to help it move around. Another form of uh, motility would be a flagellum, which is a long whip-like structure. And if you look under a, an electron microscope, it looks almost mechanical and it kind of spins around in a circle, which makes it whip back and forth. Um, the reason I, the way I remember this is flag. A flag will fly back and forth in the wind. A flagella will flip back and forth to help move. In animals, the most notable example of a flagella is sperm but flagella are also found in microorganisms and sometimes they even have two or three flagella. Let's talk about the outside of the cell. We talked about everything inside of the cell from the nucleus to the cytoplasm to the organelles inside the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane on the outside. But going further than that, both plants and animals have a plasma membrane. Here you can see the phospholipid bilayer but on the outside of plant cells, you have a cell wall. And the cell wall is a thick structure made of cellulose. Here we can see a diagram of cellulose, which is a long chain carbohydrate, but it has these cross linkages, which allows cellulose to become very strong and uh, flexible. And humans, we can't really digest that. So we can't use that sugar for energy. It is used for structure. And we glue that cell wall onto the phospholipid bilayer with another type of carbohydrate called pectin. So pectin is a jelly-like carbohydrate. It's very sticky and it helps to hold or adhere the cellular membrane to the cellular wall. Animals also have an extracellular matrix, but theirs is not nearly as organized. It's kind of jumbled up and it changes depending on what cell you're talking about. I don't need you to memorize the different parts of the extracellular matrix. Just know that it has a purpose and that it's there. Um, it's going to have things like collagen and keratin for structure. It's going to have carbohydrates like glycoproteins or glycolipids for identification. And it will have other types of structures for cell to cell communication, cell receptors, things like that um, for its extracellular functions. Now, other things about the extracellular functions are how do cells link to each other? How do they, multicellular organisms, they don't just fall apart, the cells are stuck to each other. The main way that they're stuck to each other is with something called a tight junction. Here's an image of a tight junction. The tight junction is like glue. There's no wiggle room. It is stuck together. That phospholipid bilayer is going to be stuck very, very close. Then you have something like a desmosome, which you can see here. A desmosome helps to resist stretching and tearing. Um, so it's going to be in more flexible um, tissues. And it has these large anchors, uh, these large filaments that act as anchors and stretch throughout the whole cell. So this is good for stretching. And then we have gap junctions. Gap junctions help for cell uh, to share nutrients, share water, share different things. It's connected with these connexons that are little protein channels that allow nutrients to flow from one cell to another. 
Now, all of these are examples from animal cells. Plant cells also have to uh, share uh, nutrients, but they do it in a less specific way. Because plants have a thick cell wall, their cell membrane, the plasma membrane, will actually cut a tunnel through the both cell walls and create this very large opening called a plasmodesmata, okay? So plants have a plasmodesmata. It allows nutrients through, but it's not as specific as the connexons. So the connexons is a, kind of a small opening made up of a protein channel, whereas here the phospholipid bilayer actually extends through this tunnel. So if I were to ask you a question like, which type of junction is present between cells that might undergo stretching? You would say a desmosome, okay? Here we have a picture of a cell and we can do an exercise where we uh, identify the different structures of the cell. I want you to think about things like that. It's asking you to or, uh, identify organelles that are involved in protein synthesis. Well, just follow the path of a protein. It's gonna start as genetic material in the nucleus, then the ribosome will turn it into a protein in the endoplasm reticulum. And then a piece of the lumen will pinch off and join the Golgi apparatus where it will be folded and then it will be sent to the edge. So that would be the path of a protein. When we're talking about a plant cell, the unique organelles to a plant cell will be the large central vacuole the chloroplast and the cell wall. All right, let's compare a prokaryotic cell to a eukaryotic cell. Eukaryotic means that it has a true nucleus. So plants and animals count as eukaryotic. Okay, but a bacteria does not have a nucleus. It has an area where its DNA kind of collects called a nucleoid. Prokaryotic cells are also much smaller. If you want to click on this image, you can go to a model where you can compare plant and animal cells. So here we see a plant cell, and you can see all the different parts of a plant cell. Um, and if you click on them, you can actually learn more about them. So that's an option um, to explore that. But let's talk about bacteria for a second. I can click on this bacteria and see another model um, of a bacteria. Let's look, why are bacteria so small? Bacteria are very small because they need to have um, very small uh, surface to volume ratio. So if I were to use these, these have the same amount of cytoplasm, but diffusion is gonna happen a lot faster in the small cells. If I need an oxygen molecule to diffuse through here, I have a lot less distance to travel in a small cell than a large cell. So bacteria are pretty much limited in how big they can get because they do not have membrane bound organelles. They have to stay small. They do have a nucleoid where the DNA stays and they have a cell wall, but instead of being made of cellulose, it's made up of peptidoglycan. The endosymbiotic theory is a theory that our mitochondria and even our chloroplasts probably a long, 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 long time ago may have been a, an independent bacterium. And that's why it has its own DNA. Um, it's theorized that a large amoeba-like organism engulfed the bacterium, but instead of digesting it, it found that it was producing a lot of energy. And so it was better to keep it alive. And so a symbiotic relationship was born between the bacteria and the amoeba. And eventually that led to it becoming a mitochondria. So very interesting theory if you wanna look more into that. It's called endosymbiosis. Here we see the difference between a gram negative uh, bacteria and a gram positive bacteria. They both have peptidoglycan, but actually a gram negative bacteria is going to have two phospholipid bilayers. So gram negative bacteria have different um, characteristics based on that. And you can actually go to the cell model and look at the difference between a gram positive and a gram negative bacteria. They both have a nucleoid but one is going to have a thick cell envelope and one is going to have a thin cell envelope with a second layer. So gram negative are usually a little bit harder to kill because they have two phospholipid bilayers. 
as always, don't forget you have your optional chapter homework right here where you can do a drag and drop activity and learn. Click on the chapter laboratory write up and bring it to lab class or scan the QR code and complete it at home. And don't forget your weekly quiz. It is on Blackboard and you get two chances to take it. Make sure that you utilize that second chance for improvement. As always, we have our resources here, the textbook, flashcards, and games. And don't forget that outside of this PowerPoint, there is a quizzes, a practice quiz that you can use for all of your uh, practice and studying needs. Thank you for joining me this week and y'all have a great week. I'll see you next time.